All right, so next to the session with um, Michael Crail, a topic that we should all be concerned about, which is whether there was what we call the social bot networks impacting the social networks or the media outlets and the academics estimating the impact of these overestimated or underestimated. So Michael is going to go into overview of the research that was done, how it was performed and whether it was relevant because we know from so many places that uh, with events such as the recent elections in major economies and the Brexit, uh, some academics started to claim that there was um, um, impact of some unknown source that employed a bots network. Was it so? Was the research relevant? Not for me to say, but you can welcome Michael on stage, who did a lot of research and knows a thing or two about big data. On to you, Michael. Thank you. So, I'm Michael. Um, I'm a data scientist, uh, then became somehow a data journalist. Um, you can see some of my projects here. Um, you might have seen one or two. Um, some of them got awarded. Um, I'm proud of that. So, for example, the tel tel all telephone project, where you can actually see how a politician moved through Germany over a period of six months, just based on his metadata of his, uh, what, what the telephone company can collect about him. And when you work a lot of, with a lot of data, you also automatically become an open data activist, because it's uh, horrible on how much information you don't get. Um, uh, but they're important. Um, and s since I'm really interested in projects about huge amounts of data and what kind of impact technology has to the society, I really fell in love with the idea that somehow social bots influenced the public opinion and even changed um, uh, elections. So it would be what well, is a perfect topic for me. And also, you have to scrape a lot of data, analyze it, and read a lot of scientific papers. Um, yeah, so it is the, it's the perfect project. So for uh, some of you who probably don't know how the API of Twitter works, I'll make a, like a really simple uh, introduction into that. So basically, Twitter is not one application. It's two applications, one in the front end, one in the back end. On the left side, that's the usual web interface. On the right side, it's like the Twitter cloud, like a decentralized uh, database. And you make some request, like this is not actually the, the correct request, but give me that or that tweet. And the cloud responds, well, here's the JSON, uh, including when was the tweet created, what is the text, how many retweets, how many f favorites, um, is it quoted, and, and stuff like that. Is it part of a conversation? And that's how the web front end is communicating with the back end. So it is not a new page that is loaded. It's actually a JavaScript um, uh, web application that updates. Um, yeah. And the good thing is, if you have that kind of architecture, you can use many different uh, front ends. So not just Twitter.com. You can also use the iPhone, iPad, Android applications, also into, uh, included in the operating system. There's other stuff like Hootsuite, TweetDeck, Echophone, TweetBots, so third-party uh, Twitter clients. But also Facebook can automatically post Facebook posts on, on Twitter, Instagram photos, Tumblr, if this and that. Probably some of you know these things. And you can even add more stuff, like this guy who added sensors to his plant, so it can automatically tweet to Twitter when it's thirsty. Um, and uh, this is my infrastructure. It's a Raspberry Pi 4 um, with uh, 4 gigabyte running in, under the couch in my home. Um, and what I did on that is I made a special application, um, like, like a front end for Twitter, but um, it is actually simulating being multiple users at the same time. And how I did that? Basically, I made a web page where can, people can donate an access token to Twitter. Um, that screenshot is 700 people, but I think we have roughly about 800 accounts. And that means we can scrape through Twitter with, uh, uh, scrape through Twitter with the speed of 800 uh, people. And that is, 
really, really powerful. And by the way, thanks to the help uh, of Logbook, uh, Logbook Netzpolitik, it's a podcast in uh, Berlin or in Germany uh, that helped me to, to uh, find people uh, who will donate their tokens. And if you have this, um, well, if you raise the rate limit of this API to that level, you can do really cool stuff. Like, for example, I scrape 1.6 million German-speaking uh, Twitter accounts and can visualize them in a huge social network and make specific analysis on what kind of subgroups are in there, where are the political parties, what are the groups who are spreading actually fake news, uh, where are the right wings, where's the porn bubble. Um, so, yeah, you see the good and the bad part of our society on Twitter. Um, so I would summarize that my Kung Fu is strong. Let's find social bots. Um, so to, as an introduction, basically, you got a lot of uh, media attention about that topic, like especially after the Donald Trump election, automated pro-Trump bots overwhelmed pro-Clinton uh, messages, researchers say, uh, from the New York Times, and also BBC, uh, Washington Post, Wise, and a lot of other um, media discussed that social bots have actually influenced the Brexit referendum, uh, the election of Donald Trump, uh, and other, uh, mother, uh, uh, many more. And what I did is just basically Google what are the 40 most important um, uh, reports on that. So you see every single point is an article. Um, this is an interactive tool. It's online. I will give you the link later. Uh, and you can see which media outlets reported this article. And when you read every single article, you can find out what is the main source of that article. And you will see that most of the articles uh, is, are referring to a research group at the University of Oxford. It's the computational propaganda uh, project of the Oxford University. Uh, the second most referred research group is a, a cooperation between Southern California and Indiana. And the third group is Berkeley and Swansea. Um, so these three research groups are basically the basis of all the discussions we're currently having about social bots. Now get through it. The first one, Computation Propaganda Project of Oxford. They made a lot of, um, uh, published a lot of uh, research papers about, for example, here the UK uh, referendum about Brexit, and then papers about presidential debates, first, second, third, and also the US election, many more. It's just a small uh, subset of them. And since I love scientific papers, it's actually my favorite lit literature. Um, I've noticed something strange. This is actually not a scientific paper. It's called a data memo. What is a data memo? Well, they explain it themselves. And they say they reflect myth, myth well, explain blah, 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 whatever, but they have not been peer reviewed. What does it mean? A peer review means that other scientists read your scientific paper and try to figure out if that works, if the method is OK, can we reproduce the results, and stuff like that. Um, and since that is a data memo, it means that this, this thing was never published in a scientific journal, probably it failed uh, peer review. It means other scientists say, OK, that, is, that paper does not reach the scientific quality to actually publish that. So it was never printed in a scientific journal, but it got a huge coverage on the media. And that is strange. And when you dig more into that paper, you will figure out what is the basic definition of social bots in there. And they, sign, uh, they say, we define a high level of automation as accounts that post at least 50 times a day using one of these election-related hashtags. So that is their basic social bot criteria. Every Twitter account that tweets more than 50 times a day. Basically, uh, by the way, I know a guy um, in the German parliament who tweets 300 times a day. So it would be six-fold social bot or whatever. Also, I'm trying to reproduce the results. There's some archive data uh, from the US election. And what I've figured out is that what the paper is claiming, um, th these are tweets, normal tweets. And I mark some of them who uses the, these, these uh, election-related uh, hashtags. And they claim that they counted the, uh, all, uh, only the tweets with the hashtags. But if I want to reproduce it, I can in no way near these numbers. So what they're actually doing is, or what I'm guessing what they're doing, is counting every tweet uh, that it counts saying. So what it means is the methods they claim in the papers does not get generate the results they're claiming. Um, so to sum it up, 
we define social bots as accounts that tweet more than 50 times a day. And this is not good. So for example, uh, I scraped a lot of Twitter accounts, famous accounts with more than 50 uh, tweets per day, is Starbucks, McDonald's, Ask PlayStation, British Airways, uh, Airways including journalist Glenn, Glenn Greenwald or author Cory Doctorow. And you find a lot of media outlets in there like New York Times, CNN, NBA, NFL, The Economist, Reuters, uh, Wall Street Journal, Time, Forbes, and whatever. So all these media outlets, whenever they cover the US election, it will be counted as social bot influence uh, uh, to, uh, to, this, to this election. Um, and I tried it to make it in a bigger way. They claim, for example, that 17.9% of the tweets around a US election comes from social bots. If I scan, I'm not sure, I think it was 200,000, 300,000 verified accounts. Verified accounts means these accounts went to Twitter and said, okay, I'm a company, I'm a person, um, I'm, I'm, a real, uh, I'm a real person. If I count them, they produce 30%. Uh, social bot tweets. So verified accounts seems to be worse than social bots. I'm not sure. It doesn't make sense. So that's why I'm having questions to uh, the computation propaganda uh, project of Oxford. Uh, the first is, does using a pro-Trump hashtag mean someone is pro-Trump? Of course not. Because, for example, I could talk about the haters or lovers or fans or whatever about Trump. It doesn't mean that I'm actually trying to influence uh, in a way that I'm pro-Trump, something like that. Spam accounts are usually using trending hashtags. I'm not sure if you noticed that there's a lot of spam on Twitter. For example, if we have a hashtag for this conference, probably some spam accounts will just use the hashtag OpenFest to share their links to AP, uh, apps or Bitcoin or porn or whatever. Um, and they are also accounted uh, as a social bot influence. Uh, 50 tweets per day is heavy automation. I don't think so, to write 50 tweets. It's like Twitter becomes like a chat room if you have a long discussion with other people. And nobody would imagine that if I'm uh, uh, writing more than 15 whatever WhatsApp messages, messages, that it makes me a social bot. And by the way, why is 50, not 30 or 100? I, I didn't find any proof why they choose 50. Um, and do they have any proof that they found social bots? They just uh, pushed out numbers, but they didn't say what kind of accounts they actually found. Um, and they didn't prove that this had any influence on the election. And my biggest question is, why is Comprop not sharing the data and the source code? I think that would be good to actually, or makes it easier for other scientists to, to verify their results. Um, why do they make it hard to verify their results? Hmm. So when I'm trying to reproduce uh, this paper, or this paper from, from uh, University of Oxford, I usually find out that they detect active users, makes sense, more than 50 uh, tweets per day. So usually it's supporters, journalists, and spammers. But I couldn't find a social bot in that. At least no bot that actually uh, had an impact. <clears throat> yeah, but that is the most uh, used research uh, or re reference research um, 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 in, in the media coverage. The second group is South California, Indiana. What they did is they, bought a, they developed a tool called Botometer, um, formerly known as uh, Bot or Not. And what they did is they take two lists, one list of social bots, a list of where they're pretty sure that they're social bots, and one list of humans. Then they fetch all the metadata and put it in some kind of machine learning. Well, it's just a linear model, as far as I can understand that. And they claim that they have a very higher accuracy to distinguish between bots and humans just based on the metadata. Well, that's not correct. Well, the first thing that's wrong, they don't have the list with social bots. So if you train that machine learning, you need some kind of a, well, training material. And since they don't have social bots, they just use some honeypot data. And what they trained it on was spam accounts. So, and the second thing is uh, high accuracy. When you actually test it, you figure out they never verified it in the wild. So they um, have a high accuracy to um, distinguish between these perfect groups of spam accounts and humans, but they never verified if it actually works in the wild that some other random accounts, like for example, the New York Times and, and uh, accounts like that, if they are um, uh, um, clustered uh, correctly. But the good thing is that the bottom meter is online. You can use that with a web interface, and there's also an API you can use. And I did that, for example, in April 2018. 
and I scanned multiple Twitter lists to check out if the system works or not. And one list is a list of Twitter accounts where I'm pretty sure that they are all humans, and that's the list of uh, the members of the US Congress. And they're almost 50% bots. <laughs> and it was fun. So I started more tests and more tests. Uh, Nobel Prize winners, 12% bots. They I found a list of 3,000 female directors, 14% bots. From 96 NASA accounts, 14% are bots, even astronauts. 70% uh, of Reuters journalists, 22% of the UN women staff. Um, there's a news agency, DPR, 30% uh, of the Federal Parliament of Bavaria are bots. And uh, a few weeks ago, I posted this chart. Sorry, uh, the headline is in German, but basically it checks the different local uh, um, federal parliaments um, uh, in Germany. And uh, Saarland has even 40% uh, bots in the parliament. So, OK, that's uh, quite high false positive rates. But maybe the system is good for detecting bots. And somebody uh, gave me the hint there's actually a bot wiki where you can Oh, as a developer, say, OK, I've uh, developed this, this spot on, on, on Twitter, use the source code, or whatever, the Twitter account, I scrape this wiki and find 937 bots from this bot wiki and check it with Botometer, and 61% of them are humans. So the system neither works detecting humans nor bots. So Botometer reaches false positive and false negative rates up to 50% and more, and that's worse than flipping a coin. Yeah. But the problem is it's not just the research of uh, South California and Indiana. Uh, it's also used by many other uh, scientists. So you will find out, but there's a good argument from University of Dusseldorf or that institution and, and so on. And if you dig in, you find out, OK, they basically used, for example, the Botometer um, uh, API. So here's social bots in election campaigns. Uh, it's a paper from Tobias Keller and Ulrike Klinger. And they calculated that of German parties, 10% are bots. Um, I tried to uh, reproduce the results, but the funny thing is that I think in the second half of 2018, Botometer made an update. So they changed the algorithm or the parameter, nobody knows. So I can't reproduce the paper anymore. If I do it, I get totally different numbers. Now it's not just 10%, now it's 53% are bots. So it actually rises somehow magically. Um, this graphic is a little bit complicated to explain what I did here. Um, so Botometer is using this machine algorithm to uh, train it on metadata. And what they do is, for every Twitter account, extract the metadata and figuring out how many followers, thoughts, um, tweets, in which language, uh, and stuff like that. So it got basically a big vector of 100 or 1,000 uh, uh, values per Twitter account. And they use that for machine learning. And I put in a different uh, algorithm called UMAP. Um, it's uh, basically, if you have a high dimensional space and you try to fit it into 2D, you can do it that way. And what it is generating as a graph is a lot of tiny groups with similar uh, properties. So for example, you have a small group that is quite inactive uh, and very old. And this is a group that is very active and new or uses a specific uh, Twitter app and stuff like that. And if you organize it in that way, um, you can actually dig into these single groups and figure out what are they and why is Botometer um, well, uh, thinking that they are bots. So uh, by the way, I'm open source sourcing that too. So you can uh, run it on, a, uh, on GitHub um, maybe in an hour. Um, so now you can, can colorize these accounts in different ways. So this is, for example, the, uh, the number of tweets these accounts sent. And you see everything on the right side, all the blue ones are accounts that just sent one tweet. So for example, persons who joined Twitter just sent one tweet. And that was 10 years ago and never used Twitter again, just to trying it out. They are all uh, categorized as social bots. And that seems to be even reproducible. So for example, you can go to Twitter, create a new account, and just send one tweet like, hello world, or welcome to OpenFest, or whatever, and you will be categorized as social bot, even if you're not active or doing anything. Um, now the yellow and uh, uh, orange or red uh, accounts on the right side, they are inactive for years, so even uh, uh, 10 years and more. Um, 
this is a group uh, of people that are actually active and interact, interact with other people. So they have discussion, replying to each other, mentioning uh, stuff, and, and so on. Um, if, if you really dig into the data, you actually find two groups, these tiny ones. These are accounts that are active and obviously automated and trying to use hashtags, uh, sharing URLs and stuff like that. And if you click on it, and um, you should be thankful that I didn't make screenshots, because it's not just hashtag spam, it's URL spam, and it's a lot of porn spam. So promoting porn websites with really ugly pictures, uh, you will find them there, don't click on it. But I couldn't find a single political bot. So Botometer is a black box algorithm that classifies people as bots and del del should I shouldn't choose that word, delegitimizes movement. Uh, and that's a problem. Actually, we have multiple movement where um, um, the opposite side just said, OK, there are social bots. Or, yeah. um, and I think it's a problem if you have a black box algorithm that has a social impact uh, and is closed source. I think whenever you have some kind of an algorithm that categorizes people, it should be open source. And if, if it categorizes movement or groups of people, uh, it should also be open source. We have to look into that, what, what is the basis of, of the decision. But there's one more. We also have Berkeley Swansea. And to be honest with you, I, I have uh, no interest at all in into reproducing that too. They have a quite, quite complicated heuristic approach. So basically, as they said, social bots are very active and have less followers and whatever. And I don't really want to recode the thing. I would love that if they just uh, shared their source code. But I found another one, uh, uh, a blog post from a guy named uh, Mike Kern. I'm one of the very, very few people in the world who has actually fought bots on social media platforms. As a member of the Google abuse team from 2010 to 2013, I spent a large amount of time working on anti-spam and anti-automation platforms. Um, so he basically knows what he's doing. And he's reading the article and basically saying, OK, you, that's not OK to use that definition to find uh, social bots. The thing why I'm mentioning that is not just he's giving a quite good overview about uh, Berkeley and Swansea, but I'm really loving his last sentence. It's the most irresponsible abuse of math I've ever seen for a long time. And I think it's a, I think it's a really good uh, uh, summary. But I want to focus on one other scientific paper from Swansea Berkeley, social media sentiment and public opinion, and so on. So what they do is they have a theory. And the theory is if, for example, in, in the United States, there are more votes for Donald Trump, so for example, there are more support, uh, Trump supporters, then you will also see on Twitter that there are more tweets for Trump. That makes sense. Yeah, of course. If the numbers of voters rises, then the numbers of tweets in favor of Trump will rise. So what they then did is calculated in a magical way that social bots generated tweets for Trump in, in favor of Trump. And the conclusion is that means that also the social bot influenced the whole election. So by influencing a small subset of the population means that it also influenced everything. And they got this amazing number of that 3.23 percentage points uh, uh, of the actual votes uh, go to Trump are based on social bots. And if you really read the paper, you, you will notice that, that, that it's challenging to see that as logical. It's not. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, yeah. But OK, time.com and Huffington Post are really, uh, really eager to, to uh, uh, write articles about that. Uh, Twitter bots may have boosted Donald Trump's votes by 3.23 percentage points, researchers say. Yeah. But it's, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I promise to not use swear words in this talk. Um, there's a, um, I think it's a few months ago, I think it's in July or June uh, this year, social media bots deceived e-cigarettes user. Um, uh, this uh, Scientific American was also in Washington Post and stuff like that. A group called um, the Public Good Project um, make some kind of magic data analysis on how many social bots on Twitter um, uh, influenced like the e-vapor uh, discussion and once so on. And, um, 
PG, uh, PGP is the name of the group. Don't confuse it with the um, encryption. Uh, PGP is able to identify which posts have high, li uh, high likelihood of originating from bots and which have a high likelihood of originating from humans. So they just claim they have this ability, but they actually don't really explain how the method works or publish the data or publish the source code. So um, yeah. Uh, later, the um, I'm not sure which medium was, but but a fight over vaping bots are, is blazing while e-cigarettes bans loom. Um, dehuman dehumanizing opposition by calling people bots is just a way to attack vaping. Um, yeah, so that's that's the thing um, that that you can basically claim every group on Twitter that they are bots, uh, and this group now has the challenge to prove that it's not true. But what PGP is here doing is they had no explanation of the method. They don't publish any source code. They don't publish any data. And all they have is bold and unproven allegations. So after reading these paper for, I think, two, two and a half years, uh, my conclusion is social bot research is a total disaster. The whole theory of social bots influence elections can be fully explained by the failure of these research groups. Research groups of Oxford, South, South California, Indiana, Berkeley, Swansea, invented methods that are unscientific, have never been proven, have terrible false positive rates, and are easy to falsify. All the papers have to be reviewed again and have to be revoked uh, if necessary. Uh, this includes all other research from all other groups using the methods. You can't, as a scientist, just choose Spotometer as a scientific tool. It's not. Um, it's, it's just... Uh, um, it's, if, if, you, if, if, you, if you have a telescope, that is a scientific uh, uh, instrument. But Botometer is just a closed source service somewhere on the internet, uh, and, and that's, not a, that's not a good source. So how, how we got in that mess? Many media outlets were shocked by Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, and they were desperately looking for an explanation. Unknown scientists gave them one. Um, some scientists are in the center of media attention. This is good for their ego and their funding, but this is bad for unbiased science. Uh, we need the scientific community to conduct an unbiased review of these social bot papers. Unfortunately, I'm not part of that community. All I can do is um, pointing in that direction, showing my methods, and open sourcing them. Um, link follows later. Um, and I hope that more and more uh, researchers will, will do that. Um, actually, one a group from Adrian, Adrian Rauchfleisch and Jonas Kaiser approached me, and they had a preliminary paper that's not published yet, The False Positive Problems of Automatic Bot Detection. Uh, and I heard that more stuff is coming, um, but unfortunately, science is slow, but journalism is fast, and we might have to take a, a few more months. Uh, how we fix that mess? I demand that the research groups of Oxford, South California, Indiana, Berkeley, Swansea, publish their source code in all versions, and share the data with third parties, just even to make, uh, make the papers reproducible. And why it is urgent? Well, currently dangerous and stupid laws are being prepared. Uh, I know that, for example, I'm not sure if it's in California, but at least in, in the United States, um, uh, there are some laws in preparation to prevent social bots by labeling it and whatever. Just, just imagine, <laughs> Even if there were some kind of Russian controlled social bots, they probably will not label uh, I'm a social bot. So, so these laws are quite stupid. Uh, this is a, a blog post of a um, net politics uh, group in uh, Germany, Load e.V. We need a fact based digital media policy regulation of social bots. Um, and this, for example, uh, the, so, well, the direct translation would be a state media treaty. Um, they, they're saying that uh, in the future, every automated, automatically generated uh, tweet has to be labeled as bot. And just think about how, for example, a public uh, 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 journalistic medium, now whenever they publish an article and the Twitter account is automatically saying, oh, we publish a new article, they have to uh, add in the end, this is a bot tweet. And this is more fueling fake news and whatever, and it's not helping uh, journalism, it's not helping um, uh, the things we are currently seeing in uh, worldwide. Dear scientists, please learn from open source and open data community, especially if you have uh, algorithms with uh, impact, for example, categorizing uh, humans um, and uh, categorizing movements or um, oppositions. 
Um, this is really dangerous, um, and you should, and I think um, there's always the spirit in science to um, being easily verifiable and falsifiable, and since we now have the internet, it's possible, especially in data science, um, to just publish your code, uh, and uh, if it's not private data, you can also open uh, that data. So that was my short wrap-up for um, the failed social bot research. Um, there's, some, there's a Twitter account, you can follow me there. There's an email address. I'm especially interested in more information about other research groups who are trying to verify and falsify these methods. And I'm also interested what are the current uh, legislative initiatives, so other laws and other, companies, uh, other countries trying to fight social bot, what is actually happening uh, wide world, uh, worldwide. And all the slides, notes, papers, source, the codes, tools, data, and graphics, I will put up in a, in a wiki. Um, so if you have any question or additional information, I will just try to combine all the things uh, around the failed of, failure of social bot research. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for all the great insights and all these data that you gathered and everybody else who should already be convinced that this is important and uh, is not a child's play is very welcome to the Q&A corner right over there in the D room where you can ask questions uh, and have some incredible answers uh, from Michael. Um, I was happy to be able to talk with him yesterday at the speaker's dinner, and I can say he knows a lot about this topic, so you can trust his opinion, even though he's not part of the academic community, and only the academic community suffers from this. So thanks again, Michael. Thank you.